You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome back to Win the Day. The quote for today's episode comes from Keith Ferrazzi and says, success in any field, but especially in business, is about working with people, not against them. There's less than a handful of people on the entire planet currently alive today whose work has continually and significantly impacted my life. Without even knowing these people personally, they've spoken to me through their life-changing books and given me the confidence and tools that really inspired the mission that I'm on now and that I will continue until my dying breath. Today, I'm extremely grateful to have one of those people on the Win The Day show, Keith Ferrazzi. Keith is undoubtedly the global leader in relationships and networking. In fact, he's often cited as the modern day Dale Carnegie. For those who don't know, Dale Carnegie is author of one of the most impactful books I've ever read, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And there's a good chance that you've read that too. As longtime fans of the Win the Day show will recall, relationships have been by far the most important ingredient in literally every success I have enjoyed to this point, and I'm sure will be responsible for every opportunity that arrives in the future. I've spoken before about my struggles through high school and as a young adult, and that it was really only at the age of 23 when I felt focused and empowered for the first time. But the journey from then certainly wasn't a straight line. In 2012, I moved to Boston on the east coast of the US, about as far away from my hometown of Brisbane in Australia as you can get. I was 28 at the time, and I moved there to study an MBA. And early in that university program, they mentioned Keith's book, Never Read Alone, so I grabbed a copy. The number one New York Times bestselling book showed how being genuinely interested in other people, being of thoughtful service to others, and constantly learning and practicing every day are the foundations to making every one of our own dreams come true. This philosophy had a profound impact on my life. Keith's blueprint to success in relationships, along with Carol Dweck's growth mindset and Napoleon Hill's achievement principles, are what have shaped my mindset today and really underpin everything that I do. Yet more than ever, I see people who want magic bullets to success and the secret to instant monetization. However, this focus on immediate gratification all but nullifies the opportunity to establish authentic, lifelong connections that can provide enormously transformational experiences, not just for us, but the people we meet too. In May this year, during my presentation at our virtual event house sessions, I even mentioned that my number one tip for monetization is not advertising, which everyone kills themselves to get, it's relationships. It's giving without the expectation of anything in return. It's boldly being of service. And it's knowing how to leverage the people in your network, the ones who would do anything to help you to achieve your mission. In this episode of Win the Day, we have Keith Ferrazzi, the number one New York Times bestselling author of books like Never Eat Alone, Who's Got Your Back, and the brand new Leading Without Authority. Keith leads executive teams of some of the most well-known companies in the world, including Delta Airlines, General Motors, and Verizon. When he was just a summer intern at accounting firm Deloitte, one of the biggest accounting firms in the world, Keith used the power of relationships to become the youngest chief marketing officer of a Fortune 500 company and the youngest partner in Deloitte history, all before he turned 30. In addition to relationships and networking, Keith is recognized as the world's foremost authority on remote work. At a time when most teams are failing and the global pandemic has pushed the majority of organizations to remote work, Keith's mission is more important than ever. In this episode, we talk about how to create a high-performing company in a rapidly changing world, why a title or lack of one should never stop you, how to establish relationships with people far higher up the pecking order, how to turn a generic, how can I be of service, into actually being of service, and a whole lot more. I've never been more excited for an interview. Let's welcome Keith Ferrazzi. Well, Keith Ferrazzi, thanks so much for being on the show. Great to see you. James, looking forward to this. Thank you. First of all, I know we were talking offline, but I wanted to quickly give a public acknowledgement, uh, just basically express my gratitude for all you've done, uh, not just to help me, but to help the world through your work. It's had a profound impact on my career, on my life, and I know of millions of other people around the world. So first of all, I just wanted to say a big thank you. This means a lot to me that you're on the show today. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. 
Well, first question, I know this is a little bit of a, a long-winded one, but three of the most impactful books I've ever read, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Think and Grow Rich, and your book, Never Eat Alone. And these books talk about being genuinely interested By in- By the way, they, those are the three books that have the big, biggest impact on my life too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good coincidence then. Well, yeah, those books talk about being genuinely interested in other people and the power of the mastermind, how we can all go higher together and the importance of working on your relationships now rather than when you desperately need them. Uh, these books, including yours, have enormously shaped my mindset and have created all the opportunities and relationships and everything I have in my life today. And all your work talks about relationships. But I want to know early on in your career, did you have relationships with any books like the ones I just mentioned that played a pivotal role early on? Well, uh, yes, particularly how to win friends and influence people. As I said, I really meant that my father gave me that book when I was a young boy. And, um, you know, and I have to say there's nothing more gratifying to me than when some pe somebody will say to me or introduce me, well, he is the modern day Dale Carnegie relative to how to win friends and influence people. And that's, that's such a big, that's such a big appreciation. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I would say that. But I would also, uh, I'll give you another one that you wouldn't imagine, The Great Gatsby. Um, so growing up, um, I was a poor kid from the wrong side of the tracks and I got to go to some pretty prestigious schools thanks to my parents' commitment to education. And through that, um, I also created and, and, and absorbed a great deal of insecurity. I didn't feel I deserved to be in the room. I wasn't as good as the rich kids. And if you know that last chapter of The Great Gatsby, um, Gatsby would, you know, he came from the wrong side of the tracks and he had this beautiful desire to be with Daisy Buchanan and he moved to a mansion right across the, the river, the lake, for the, uh, the ocean from her in the Long Island Sound. And he longed for that green light on her deck that someday he could aspire to be something. And that actually was his demise, um, ultimately led to his death, as you know from the book. And um, the name of my company is Farazi Greenlight. And it's always to remind me of that deep insecurity I had as a kid and how that insecurity could really be my demise if I didn't watch out for it. So the great Gatsby was a, was a warning to me um, as a young man. I love it. And the moment you said green light, I suspected that's where you were heading with it too. Well, I just finished your, your awesome new book, Leading Without Authority, where you introduce the concept of co-elevation as a new workplace operating system. And I think it's a brilliant idea. And given what we're facing at the moment with this pandemic, I think that it's absolutely necessary for any business if it's to even survive, given the times that we're in. For those who haven't read the book, what is co-elevation and what problems does it solve in this rapidly changing world we're in? Yeah, thanks, James. So <clears throat> co-elevation is a shift of, op of an operating system in the workplace. And in the last four months, we have seen more innovation change the way of work than we have in 20 years. We've been talking about the future of work for 20 years. It happened in four months. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, how are we as leaders and how are we as teams and how we are we in organizations in a, in a post-COVID, post-pandemic um, world. And today, you read my book, Never Read Alone. It's about networking. Today, we work in networks. Anybody who's listening to this podcast believes and has to understand that your dreams, your hopes, your aspiration are going to happen by your capacity to create a team around you that will co-create and fulfill the mission that you have. But the mission that you have is owned by the team. So your mission, when you invite somebody into it, you're inviting them into their mission as well. And that journey of co-creation, of, of taking a hill together, right? And at the same time, are you going for that shared mission as a team? You're all also equally as committed to each other's development. So it's a co-elevation is a commitment to a shared mission and a commitment to each other. When a team has that, nothing can stop them. I love that. And that's co-elevation. 
Yeah, another big theme of the book is, yeah, you talk about maximising each other's capabilities should be the, the responsibility of any member of the team. I think that's, that's so important, whether it's, a, you know, whether it's a sporting team or whether it's a, a business team or a, or a family team, so many different types of teams there are. But in the business world, we have these hierarchies, we have this job title uh, where a lot of people, perhaps they're in a junior role and they don't feel comfortable approaching someone higher or maybe they're higher up and they're resting on their laurels because they have that job title. What's the problem with traditional leadership and people focusing so much on their job title in an organization? I have to take a step back to recognize the world we live in today. The world we live in today is demanding transformational levels of change from all of us. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're an individual, achieving anything in this world requires that you consume radically uh, large volumes of information, adopt and adapt to that information to figure out what your go-to-market plan and strategy is relative to products, solutions, outreach, etc. And that you're going to have to keep pivoting because that information changes pretty frequently. That's unheard of. We've never had that. Um, major, you know, I'm coaching, I coach the transformation of teams and, you know, working with General Motors, working with Delta Airlines. That group had to wake up every day and ask themselves, what business are we in? <laughs> How do we deliver? Right? And so every one of us have to meet transformational pressures. Now, how do you do that? You cannot do that alone. You're only going to be able to do that through unleashing the insights, the wisdom, the warnings of risk, the help of a, com a relatively complex networked set of individuals. So if what you thought your job was, it was to manage your team, meaning the team of people that report to you, if you think that's going to get you there, bullshit, bullshit. There's no way you're going to meet the pressures on you by managing the resources you have. Your ability to enlist others into your goals, into your mission, into your vision, is your ability to meet the pressures of the marketplace and the transformation. If you want to be transformational, You've got to work in the network. So part of my business, you know, I coach very large executive teams, some of the biggest companies in the world. COVID hits, no big companies spending outside money on, on new consulting, right? Even McKinsey, Deloitte, Accenture, they're giving away their consulting because they, they, they don't dare ask for cash, which they know these companies aren't giving, but they want to earn loyalty, right? Um, but so from our perspective, what's the marketplace that I play in now? And we've started, you know, what we do is we, we play in, now we play in the middle market where I've coached coaches in our methodology and they deploy their, our meth, coaching methodology into smaller companies. And we have courses in, in team transformation that one can take online, digital courses. I had none of that. I had none of that on March 1. And who was the team that I was going to have? So my business hits a wall and revenues decrease, right? And now there's three businesses that I've got to, well, at least two that I've got to dial up. I haven't even talked to you about the third that I've got to create from scratch from a basis of revenue that is 30 to 50% lower. I found my team in a group of individuals that I didn't even have to pay. My, now, the co-creators of my business ended up being individuals that I had admired for years who I reached out to and I said, I've seen you know, Jim Quick, the memory expert, you know Jim. Absolutely. Um, good friend of mine reached out to him and Jim, I don't know anything about sales, online sales funnels. Like there's only, there's a thousand people that could buy my product in the world. Now I've got to sell to small and medium sized businesses and individual business consumers. Jim walked me through the sales funnel process. Peter Diamandis 
who like all of these people came out of the woodwork, Tony Robbins and his organization, all of these people joined my team to help me create my business, right? That has nothing to do with your org chart. If you're sitting here and you're thinking you're stuck, I had this conversation last night to my 25 year old foster son. He was, he's not my foster son, he's my son, but I, I got him at 16 and he's 25 now and he's bemoaning the fact that there's no work out there. You know, and I'm like, kiddo, let's talk about who's on your team to find you work. First of all, I could, obviously I could do that in a moment, right? But his ability to co-create a vision for himself and what he wants to do and invite people in to help him by him helping them figure out what's next in both of their lives, right? I mean, it's just, it's amazing how the entire world is open to you through this idea of I am going to, I'm going to create a team and we're going to help each other be successful. That's the bottom line, co collaboration. And everyone now, they're looking for that magic bullet. They want that, uh, you know, they want that instant success, whatever that might be. And a lot of, I work with a lot of podcasters and the question, the number one question they always talk about, what's the best way to monetize? And the first thing they go to is sponsors on the show. And I did a presentation for our group recently with We Are Podcast, where I spoke about the number one monetization strategy that you can have is investing in relationships. Because look at the relationships that you have been able to build for years and years and years that when you're clear on what you want and you're in a situation where you're in need and you're not afraid to call in a favor uh, from because other people that you have built up all that goodwill, they want to help you. And it's just, you know, it's something that's worth millions and millions of, of dollars to your mission and everything right now, yeah. rather than going for something uh, short term back in the day. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from your book is when you said, I never let a title or a lack of one stop me. So I wanted to ask you, how did you become the youngest CMO of a Fortune 500 company and the youngest partner in Deloitte history all by the age of 30? Yeah. So, um, and I'm going to try to do this in a way that I can coach your, 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 your listeners and viewers. Um, imagine yourself working inside of a company and the CEO says his vision is to really you know, go from eighth in the industry to one of the top consultancies in the world. And you're in the audience. What do you do with that information? Right? What do you do with that information? Do you just say, boy, that's nice and I'm glad I'm a part of a team that's gonna go there? Well, what I did was I said, okay, I went up to Mr. Lacanto, this was his name, CEO, afterward. And I said, sir, what are some of the critical elements that you have in your plan to make us become number one? Like, what are some of the things you're working on? <clears throat> and he talked a little bit about brand. He talked a little bit about marketing. Um, he talked, of course, to competencies. And I said, sir, I, I will do some research. And I know you didn't ask me to, but I'll do some research. And if I think, of, if think or see anything, I'd love to be able to reach out to you and and write these things up for you. He's like, oh, sure, kid. You know, whatever. <laughs> He's like, sure, kid, whatever. Um, well, I went back to school. I was a, I was, at the time, I was a summer intern. I went back to school, and I reached out to a professor of mine, and I said, I'd like to do a white paper on professional services marketing. And, and I said, I'd like to do that as in, in replacement for you know, some of the work that we're doing in our class. And he said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. It sounds like an interesting project. So I reached out to the top consultancies, their chief marketing officers. I told them that I had spent the summer at Deloitte. I was really intrigued by marketing in professional services. I couldn't find much about it in the industry papers. And I said, I will, I'm doing this press practices study and I'll, I'll give you the best practices study when we're done. So I was 100% transparent. Um, and I talked to, you know, Bill Mattisoni was his name from McKinsey. I talked to him about his his vision for thought leadership and how he converted thought leadership, how he extracted thought leadership from the projects at McKinsey and how he got that out into the marketplace. I talked to Jim Murphy about how he was applying traditional advertising and media and what that looked like. And then I went to the other folks at the other firms. I put it all together and I codified it in a methodology and I sent it to Pat Lacanto. I said, sir, 
you don't remember me, but I was a kid that said, I'd like to do some research and come back to you. He, I've now interviewed the chief marketing officers of all of those eight competitors. And here is the analysis of what a codified marketing strategy would be if we wanted to be, you know, rivaling one or two. Um, well, kind of blew him away. None of his partners had ever done it. He didn't have a chief marketing officer. Um, <clears throat> he called me, invited me down to dinner, flew me down from Boston where I was at the business school and had me come in to have dinner with him. And he said, kid, this is unimaginable, what you just did. Um, I want you to come work for the firm and I want you to come in and work as a, on a project around redefining marketing for the company. And I said, I would love to. Um, and I said, all I want is one-on-one -on -one dinners with you uh, every, every few months. And cause I knew that that relationship was more precious than anything else. Right. Now I did ask for more money. He didn't give it to me. Um, <laughs> and I asked him, I said, um, and if I do this job for you, will you make me chief marketing officer? And he looked at me, <laughs> he laughed. He said, no, he actually said no effing way. <laughs> he said, there's no way you'll be CMO to get that out of your head. You're a child. You're just out of business school and you would have to be a partner to be a CMO. And I said, make me a partner. He, just, <laughs> he said, you're just lucky. You know, you got this opportunity. Anyway, within three years, I was the youngest partner ever elected at the firm and the chief marketing officer of the company. It's so, yeah, all I ask for those of you listening that don't give me bullshit in your head. I mean, in chapter two of leading without authority, there's the six deadly excuses why you are mediocre. And one of them is, is laziness because the reality is that took work. The other one is deference, which means, oh, it's not my job. That wasn't my job. You know, there is no excuse for you to remain mediocre. You want to be medi You want to be extraordinary. You, you just, you, you chart your path. The book Leading Without Authority is really a prescription for that. Whether you have a, now the flip side of that is if you are, if you are a titled individual, holding on to your title is the way in which to be transformative is gonna also make you mediocre because you'll never have enough resources under your control to really break through. You need to go to Peter Diamandis. You need to go to Jim Quick. You need to you know, get James who knows everything about podcasts to teach you about podcasts, right? So you need to expand your view of team, which is chapter one of leading without authority. You need to def redefine your view of team. If you don't redefine your view of team, you will remain mediocre with mediocre resources. Yeah, it's great. And what I, what I love about the book is that how tactical it gets, it provides a great overview, but I really feel like in the second half, it really gets super tactical. So although I, although I got the audio book, I think I need to go and get the, the hardcover because there's just some, some really amazing uh, stuff in there. How did the guy, cause you know, I didn't read the, the book. Um, I didn't have time. All of the shit that was going down at COVID time was exactly when the audio book needed. And I had, I was planning on doing the audio. I had booked three days in a studio to do the audio. And number one, I didn't feel like going into a studio and like breathing on some mic that some guy was in the day before. That was number one. And number two, I really didn't have the time. I was inventing two new businesses and a third that I, again, I haven't told you about, but um, how did the guy do? It did great. And it first started off. And when I saw it wasn't you, I was disappointed because I'm a huge fan of authors reading their own. And I've, I've, I've written two books and a third one coming out in September. And I have yet to do the audio recording. I'll do the one for September. But I was disappointed when I saw that it wasn't you. But I tell you what, he actually has a voice that's fairly similar. So I feel like if you can't do the audio recording, if you're an author, at least find someone who's similar. And I felt like well, that's what I did. Similar. I, I listened job. to a bunch of guys and listen to their audios and I listened to their style. Then I got him on the phone and I said, brother, let me explain to you. Let me explain to you my passion. Let me, and so, and, and I said, I've listened to your books. I don't know who directs you, but I want to tell you, you need, you better be excited as hell about this book. This book is going to change the effing world and how we think about leadership and how we think about interdependency in the workplace and collaboration. It's redefining collaboration. And I said, you need to be excited about this. And I said, I want you to record your first chapter and send it to me. And if you're not excited enough, 
<laughs> you're not excited enough, then I need to get a new writer. <laughs> and, um, by the way, I didn't even listen to it. I knew that that's all I needed to do. I just needed to throw that gauntlet at the table. He sent me the book. I just said, yes, it was fine. He said, the chapter was fine, but I knew he'd be there. So he did, he did yeah. great. He's a good, uh, he's a good substitute for you anytime you, you sure. can't do it. Uh, and by, by the end of it, I really felt like I had, you know, because obviously it's your material and your concepts that it feels like you anyway. So it was certainly mission accomplished. Right. Uh, you often talk about vulnerability and struggle. Why is that so powerful? When you work in a world where people don't have to do what you want them to do. So that's what this book is written about. The book is written so that you can lead people who don't have to do what you want them to do. By the way, I don't think that's just people that don't report to you. I think that's people that do report to you who still don't do what you want them to do. <laughs> right. And I, I, everyone jokes about the millennials. The reality is, you know, you have to earn your right to lead. People follow you not out of authority. They follow you out of their own compulsion to do so. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the basic idea behind all of this was a word I created called opening porosity. Porousness, the, the, you know, this screen is um, not porous. Drop water on it, slides off. You know, uh, Sponge is porous, absorptive. <clears throat> you want people to be a sponge to you. You want people to be a sponge to your ideas. What opens them to you, right? Vulnerability, authenticity. People with the reptilian brain, which controls your fight flight mechanism, that is triggered when people are insecure, when people are fearful. A friend of mine, Christine Comerford, talks about people going to critter state. You know, like, like that. So many leaders have their people in critter state constantly. They're constantly in critter state. How does, you can't, you can't be innovative. You can't be risk-taking. You got to be in flow. And so porosity, it's about us. How do you create us with people? And the one human connector of a productive relationship is empathy. You open that door with vulnerability. So I even started the call, like, you ask me what book, right? And I could have stopped at never, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. But I went to Greenlight. Not only is it it's an accurate answer, but I went to Greenlight and I went to vulnerability because what a great opportunity to start this dialogue with people getting a peek into who I am, right? They open their ears more. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think uh, one of the best things that you have done is stay grounded despite a lot of the, the people that you've even mentioned on this call who you're, you know, you're rubbing shoulders and, and very close with. Uh, I think it's great that your mission you've got is still very much to help everyday people rather than trying to, you know, you're not just focusing on coaching the, the best executive teams in the world. I mean, you are doing that, but you're also doing a lot of things to help people all over the world because you're aware of the impact that one person with the right knowledge and the right expertise and the right willingness to help uh, can do for others. Well, it goes, it goes back deeper than that. My whole mission, I don't think I've ever told this story in, in any of the books. I tell it in Leading Without Authority, but my whole mission started at my dad's dinner table where my dad was unemployed. Unemployment in, uh, was rampant in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, still working family. And the, my dad's bosses and the managers at that time, they didn't care about what the workers thought. They weren't unleashing value from the organization. And so I, I vowed that I would grow up and make sure that <clears throat> I, I made an impact on leadership and an organization dynamics because I felt that we were unemployed because of it. And um, that is a very important lesson for me. And it is very humble. I do what I do at General Motors and Verizon and Delta and all these companies. I do what I do there because, um, because, because it saves jobs hundreds and thousands of jobs and people and families, you know, that's why I do what I do. Mm. That feeling from when you were young is still so strong within. So strong. Yeah. 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 Hopefully I've ironed out a lot of the insecurity, but still working on that. We'll be back with Keith shortly. First, a quick announcement for those who have their own podcast. I've just launched a brand new community called We Are Members that will help you if you want to leverage your podcast, build a thriving business and stand out in your industry. 
Our goal for We Are Members is simple. We want to take you to 15,000 US dollars in monthly revenue in the next six to 12 months. To do that, you'll get access to some of the most renowned podcasters, marketers, and entrepreneurs on the planet, all the resources and implementation notes you could possibly want, and ongoing access to me and our awesome group of members from around the world. But we're not accepting everybody. It's really important that we have the right people and an alignment of values, which as you're starting to see in this interview with Keith, is critically important. So if you're interested, go to wearepodcast.com slash members only. I'll also include a link to it in the show notes. Once you click on that link, we'll ask you a few questions about where you're at, and then you'll be able to schedule a one-on-one call with me to see if We Are Members is the right fit for you. Again, if you have a podcast and want to make money from it, this is the place for you. Click on the link in the show notes for more info or go to wearepodcast.com slash members only. All right, let's get back into the fun with Keith. What about bureaucratic bottlenecks? Like I've got a client of mine who's in the police force and he talks about how frustrated he is. And I've spoken to people over here in America as well who are also in the police force and different layers of government. They feel like they're in these bureaucratic bottlenecks as employees and they want to move up, but they don't want to wait for that tap on the shoulder. And they just feel like there's absolutely nowhere for them to go. Uh, what can employees of bureaucracies like governments do to move up the ranks quicker? Well, you know, I, frankly, the more barriers you have to progress, the more you need to influence the network. I mean, I was talking to Stanley McChrystal, General McChrystal, who's an amazing you know, business leader um, and coach. General McChrystal and I were talking about how the people in the military that really go to the top are the people who don't understand the network. You know, it's the, it's the grunts down at the front level, you know, the, the army grunts, the people, the infantry, right? They don't, they're not imagining that the network is what's going to get them there. They're just doing what they're told. But those who do awaken to that are the ones that navigate up through the hierarchy. But it's true of everything. If, you're, if you've got the, 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 the momentum of the, of the blockers of large organizations and silos and, and, and bureaucracy that's standing in your way, the only way you're going to navigate that is this. Deloitte was probably one of the worst organizations at the time. And my old point was, bullshit if I'm going to wait for 12 years until I have a shot at partner. Right? I'm going to add so much value and do it in the face of powerful people that I get, I do not, I get to, you know, go, go, I guess go directly to jail is not the answer, but you know, <laughs> I want to, I want to be able to go right around maybe that's hoops and ladders kind of thing. I want to go down the slide and win the game. Uh, I, want, I don't want to be going onesie twosies around the board. Yeah, rather than being confined by the linear progression that just because other people are in a certain role doesn't mean that you need to be there 20, 30, 40 years before you're the partner. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in March this year, as you, as you said, or I guess it started a bit earlier, but we started really feeling the effects of the pandemic around March. So we're in a whole new different world now. People are working uh, remotely. There's been a lot of unemployment, a lot of economic issues that I'm sure are still to come uh, in the coming months and years. But what about... Are there any opportunities or benefits that exist right now uniquely as a result of what's happened with the pandemic that people can use Massive. for their own personal growth? Massive. Um, so that's the third business that I just started. Um, when we were in March, everybody was panicked. And I started a, started a business. I had done a lot of research around remote teams and remote work. I did it starting in 2015 and nobody gave a damn back then i had invested two million dollars in research on running remote teams <clears throat> and i did it with harvard business school i raised the money from siemens and cisco and accenture and a bunch of others and um and i believe that remote can be better than co-located i think a lot of us are finding that it's not as bad as we thought but but with certain adaptation, you can have better collaboration, you can have more candor, you can have more innovation, you can have better relationships. There's so many things. If you engineer remote work better. So I opened a website called virtualteamswin.com. 
that was me finding opportunity in crisis, right? And through that website, we started courses and a resource center. And, and that, that point of view gave me access. I was, Zoom named me their top thought leader in remote teams. Fast Company did the same. Harvard Business Review asked me to do more pieces. Within a one month period, I had more PR, more visibility, because I read the tea leaves of where people were suffering the most, and I decided to serve that. I was talking to a gentleman this morning, Martin Lindstrom, who's just a brilliant market creator, market strategist. And you know, he was talking to me about how in times like this, you need to step back, look at the tea leaves and say, how has customer demand changed and in what way? And how do we serve that? And it might be that you serve it in something you've never served before. Unilever didn't do um, uh, hand sanitizer. And, you know, in 20 days, they had hand sanitizer on the shelves in North America, whereas it would have normally taken them six months to get a product on the shelf. And right. the hottest item in the world. <laughs> Exactly, at the time. Um, the, the world needs to, you need to look at the tea leaves and really understand and decide, how am I going to serve? So what I started is that, you know, virtualteamswin.com, we started a whole series of, we called them remote reboots. How does a team reboot itself in a remote world to make it a better team? But then I started starting hearing people talking about going back to work. What's that going to look like? And I started getting scared because I've seen, I've seen more innovation in the last four months than I have seen in 20 years. And I wanted to capture that. So I started a media site called, uh, as opposed to go back to work, it's called go forward to work. And I hired the former managing editor of Forbes, the former editor of Brand Week, a few writers, and they're collecting the world's largest database of best practices of what, how has work been redefined over the last four months? How is marketing and sales redefined? I know one large tech company that used to spend a billion dollars a year in sales travel. They've spent no money in sales travel. They've saved over 400,000, 400 million dollars in sales travel and their loyalty numbers have gone up. So what does that say? Like what, what you need to be asking yourself is kind of a couple of questions. One question is what have we seen that we've, what we've done that we like and we want to hold on to as we go forward, start curating that question with your team. And then the next question is what are the things that we're fearful in a remote world, for instance, will not be as performed as well. And then when you list those things, then stay on them and say, well, how can we do them better? Like we, we believe we've engineered a process where team meetings can actually be better in a remote world than, mm. than they were physically. So I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity right now. Sure. For people being accountable enough for their own, you know, being ownership for their, uh, being, having ownership of their actions and being agile enough to be able to figure out how they can serve more and more people in a way that might yeah. actually reduce their, their costs and increase their profitability. Uh, exactly. So you speak all over the world. You meet tens of thousands of people each year. What system do you have of keeping in touch with all those people that you meet? Um, I use salesforce.com. And I know it's a little expensive and there may be a lot of things out there. That, but what I like about it is <clears throat> that as, I, as my company has grown, what used to be a, a, a system that to track my network is now a system that allows me to track campaigns. Um, the one thing I learned since writing Never Eat Alone is that it's running a network is not about you running a bunch of individual relationships. Starting communities, and that's probably a whole conversation by itself, but starting communities is very powerful. When I started Go Forward to Work, part of the intention was to take all of my VIP relationships, pull them into a room, virtual room and say, how will we teach each other what the future of work looks like? I started a community and then I hired a community manager, this the gentleman from Forbes, who's curating that conversation. And when I'm not there, 
I'm still there. So when that group convenes with, with Bruce, I'm present in that conversation, right? So your ability to be present in conversations and build your network by building community is, is, is exp- makes you exponential in terms of your network. I love it. So much of what you talk about is making, uh, you know, it comes from that abundance mindset. It's like when you were talking about uh, hosting parties and things at your, at your house where you ask everyone to be co-hosting the, the evening to make sure everyone's got a drink in their hand yes. and make sure everyone's yes. invited into a conversation. It's, when did I say that? Was that in my new book? It's in there. Yeah, it's in the new one. Somewhere uh, about three quarters in from, uh, from memory. But yeah, it's a fantastic story and one that I actually told my business partner. Well, the point that I'm making for leaders is that leaders are great hosts. And part of being a great host is helping other people make other people comfortable. Like if I've, got a, if I've got a table of 14, I can handle that. I can make everybody comfortable, right? If I've got a party of 150, now I need to turn everybody into hosts. If everybody acts like a host to taking care of each other, everyone's going to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with your team. A great team leader is a host of a team taking care of each other. Yeah, absolutely. And in the, in the book, you talk about co-elevation in the workplace predominantly, but what about co-elevation in the home? How can it be used to improve a marriage or a relationship with your children or even a relationship with someone's parents? Yeah, thank you. Um, by the way, I, it is so infrequent that I show up and somebody's done their homework. So <laughs> you've actually read the book, consumed it. It's just amazing. Thank you. Um, the example I use a lot is my son. Right. So I could not parent my child the way that my dad parented me. I think that's true of a lot of us. Um, nor the, nor would I have wanted to. (laughs) Um, but with, with our spouses, imagine this. I mean, imagine being in a spousal relationship where your commitment is to a shared and aligned set of goals for each other, for the family, for my career, for my spouse's career and collectively we are going higher together where we are open and, and in interested in each other's challenges and innovations and critiques, not where critique isn't badgering critique is caring enough to, uh, to correct. Um, and it's received that way and is given that way. Um, you know, I'm single now. I, I've been single for five years. And, you know, I have made a commitment that my, my spouse is going to be my co partner. It's one of the reasons I didn't dive back into a relationship sooner. But, um, I mean, I think that's, that's a wonderful mark. Uh, and, and, and I'm hopeful that co-elevation is adopted by governments because we certainly need more cross-the-aisle collaboration. You know, it's, it's, get, it's starting to heat up with all of the primaries starting to, you know, getting ready for mm-hmm. and the, not the primers, the, um, um, con- the, the conventions. Yeah. Um, and the, unfortunately what we're going to see is we're going to see such divisiveness and lines drawn when what we need is we need more co-creation because we need the brilliance on all sides of the aisle to come together and fix these problems. Yeah. Focusing on the future rather than pointing fingers at what, you know, yeah. what might've got us here in the first place. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Well, how, how can someone turn a generic, how can I be of service into actually being of service? Um, well, listening helps and asking the question is easy. You know, in the case of Pat Lacanto, I, I was in the audience and I heard something. And I was like, wow, let me, let me double click on that. That sounded like important. Let me double click and let me see if I can, I can be of service. Um, you know, the, I wrote a model in, in, uh, in Who's Got Your Back around what I call the personal currency wheel. Um, it's also, I think I get into it in Leading Without Authority. There's a whole chapter on being of service and generosity. Uh, co, you know, and, and that's this idea of, I call it serve, share, and care. And the service piece is really understanding what another human values. And typically there's a, there's a checklist. They care about the kids care about their economic own personal development. They care about the careers. Uh, they care about um, being entertained. They care about uh, their intellectual growth. They care about their spirituality. 
you have a checklist of things and you are curious and, and ask people questions about things, you can start to say, oh, well, I can introduce you to this person. Or, you know, maybe I could help you here. Or, could I do some research here for you? It's, it's quite easy when you start having a framework that says, okay, James, how do I help James? Well, here's the checklist of things that I might be able to be helpful on um, and getting to go through them. You get better at it as you practice. Sure. Uh, one of the very practical things you included was just taking a moment to check in, whether it's an email, a, a, a phone call, a, a voice recording, which I actually did to a few people um, the moment that I, that I heard that on the audio book. So uh, something so simple that I think those voice recordings that I left for people combined for all the ones that I sent was maybe three and a half minutes that right. people wrote back very sincere, heartfelt messages of how much they appreciate it. So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Uh, let's move into what we call now the win the day rocket round, Keith, where we get to know the real you, where I ask 10 questions uh, for a very quick answer. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> what quote inspires you the most? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Oh, I love it. Deep that one. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Yes. <laughs> Me too. Uh, number three, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? That I'm enough. Nice. Uh, number four, what book do you gift the most? Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. John Sarno, and he studied people's lower back pain. And he has a book called Healing Lower Back Pain that stopped i used to throw my back out every year and once i read that book i have not thrown my back out in over 30 years um wow. healing lower back pain by dr john Cerno. interesting well i'll have to check it out uh number five was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower well i think the vulnerability was the vulnerability meaning my willingness to express and share vulnerability is become my superpower. I think that's what I'm noted for now is my willingness and ability to be vulnerable. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? <laughs> that there's a lot of it and you better get used to it. <laughs> number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Probably the Pope. Um, I've spent time with the Vatican and talking about the transformation of the church. Um, you know, our work is about the transformation of large organizations. And I've gotten to the Pope's consigliere, and I just have not gotten directly to the Pope in that conversation. But I think it's a powerful organization that has a lot of leverage capability. And I'd, I'd like to chat with the Pope about it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? It's not going to be a tool or resource. It's my administrative support staff. Um, having right now, I have two individuals who manage my network for me. And if, and they make that's so important that it's, it takes two staff to do it. And frees you up to do what you do best. Well, and make sure that I'm constantly engaged with the right people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Um, the Northern Lights. I want to go see the Northern Lights. That's what Emily Fletcher said. I had her on my show last, and that was her big one. And tell, number, tell her, let, let her introduce us. We'll go together. We'll take it Yeah, first. nice. Uh, and number 10, final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? Uh, work out every day. Love it. Well, grab a copy of Keith's new book, Leading Without Authority, and go and learn more about him and all the amazing things he's doing at KeithFerrazzi.com. Keith, thanks so much for being on the show. James, what a pleasure. Glad, I, glad we finally met. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Keith Ferrazzi. I'm not sure if you could tell, but I was actually a little nervous at the start, even though I've done literally hundreds of interviews at this point. Seriously, his work on resourcefulness and taking the reins of your own life, like you did at Deloitte, rather than leaving your fate in someone else's hands. These are lessons I think about literally every single day. Keith's new book, Leading Without Authority, is immensely practical, especially in the back half, and I highly recommend it. You can check out the show notes for the blog version of this episode, where we've put together the 60 best quotes from Keith Ferrazzi. You'll also find links to his new book and some other resources to help you in your journey. And if you're a podcaster looking to make money from your show, check out We Are Members, also linked in the show notes. 
That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. I certainly will after that chat with Keith. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. Always.